would like to start the, the last uh, subsection about privacy. So, Hans Walter, he's from Rutgers University, and he's known for me. Uh, and he's work for differential privacy and machine learning. He does, I know, he does many other things, but I'm really waiting for this talk. It's uh, more like tutorial kind of uh, talk about differential privacy. Thank you. So thanks for the invitation. It's my first time uh, coming to Israel. It's been a really great trip so far. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, differential privacy and, and what I'm calling collaborative learning, uh, motivated by some work I've been doing recently um, with some folks in neuroimaging. Uh, so the motivation for this type of work is, is a bit different, a bit different than the other talks uh, that we've seen today. Um, I'm interested in problems uh, in, in which we have researchers who are studying some condition like schizophrenia and who wish to collaborate. Uh, each of them, each group has a small data set and they want to be able to collaborate to learn things jointly from their data sets. Uh, so this is just advertising saying, you know, healthcare is important, you will know that. So, um, so the data that, that people want to share is going to depend a lot on the specific uh, type of research that people are doing. So in particular, you know, uh, I'm a theorist, so you know I, what happens is I say, oh yeah, people say working on medical applications, but that, there's a lot of different types of medical data. This is not a, not a monolithic thing. So in particular, you can identify a couple of different types. Uh, one is sort of what I might call human health research, um, where your data uh, are coming from subjects who have agreed or consented to be as part of a research study, and they've consented also to allow some kind of uh, reuse of the data for, for future studies. Um, this is getting increasingly. Uh, mm. It's weird. This reader has no key. It has no key. Every reader says. Use the H dot. No. Use the right hand. I just use the right. But it's it's drifting, right? Oh no. Okay, this is fine. This will be fine. Okay, I'll just I'll skip the uh, remote. That's good. Okay, so then, uh, so then there's also some cl uh, clinical care research. So there's a whole problem in what's called the secondary use of clinical data, which is basically you have uh, people who come to the hospital, you have their data in an electronic health record, and you later on like to reuse that data for some research purpose. So there, the people who go into the hospital have not necessarily consented to have their data be used for research, or you have to ask them every time they come in, and the questions you want to ask are not clear ahead of time. And finally, there's a lot of work on the epidemiology and public health. So what are the concerns here? Um, I'm, I'm focusing on the first type here, but uh, if you have different types of research groups who you know, are using the same type of measurements, in my case, uh, MRI, magnetic resonance imaging, they want to do some joint analysis across uh, their data. Uh, the, the sharing, at least in the US, we're a very uh, litigious society. So there's a, basically, if uh, I'm at a research center and I want to get my 10 friends who also work on the same problem to collaborate with me to share their data, I have to get uh, at least 11 sets of lawyers involved, one for each of them and one for me. And then they paralyzed, have to negotiate a data use agreement. And uh, you know, when we submitted a paper about this, we said, oh, it can take, um, it can take you know, maybe two months, three months to work this out. And the reviewer actually said, no, that's wrong. It took me more than a year, and I gave up on the study because, uh, you know, lawyers. So, uh, so what, where does privacy come in here? Uh, in, how is it different than the kind of other uh, scenarios we've been looking at? Uh, in previous talks, here it's not a cloud service. Um, the, the data is not sitting out in the wild. I'm not exposing things. Uh, so I don't know. I mean, I I appreciate those sort of black box, white box uh, and dichotomy in thinking about threat models, but it's not actually clear to me what the threat model is here because we're really trying to appease the lawyers. Um, other thing is that the data is not so big. I feel like maybe that's. Uh, that's the bad marketing on my part, but the data is big in the wrong direction. It's usually very high dimensional, and there you don't have very many samples. Um, so it's more wide than tall. Um, and then uh, privacy here is kind of an incentive. So the way that uh, I view making privacy guarantees is uh, as an incentive for other researchers to collaborate and say, join my research consortium so that we can understand Alzheimer's or autism or schizophrenia. So well, differential privacy is, uh, um, has been talked about a lot in this uh, <coughs> workshop. And so I, it's, it's falling to me to kind of maybe go through some of the definitions. But why is differential privacy a good 
solution for this it's because it gives uh, guarantees on this membership inference attack, right? So this is the kind of guarantee that you'd like to give to uh, subjects in a research study. That is, you know, you're doing a research study on a sensitive health topic. And the thing that you'd like to promise them is, is exactly this, this type of mm, uh, protection against this uh, membership inference attack. So it's a guarantee needed for human subjects. And uh, if you Google differential privacy, like Google Scholar, you'll see there's like thousands of papers on differential privacy, so the question is how can we, you know, there, there seems to be a, a rich set of techniques that we could apply to these kind of problems. The trick is that we have to use differential privacy for the domain-specific algorithms that are used in these research consortia. They don't use, you know, they're not just sitting around training support vector machines, they're not doing um, exactly the same kind of things that sort of broader machine, general, general uh, machine learning is doing. They, they can't use the, uh, the API training API that we heard about in Vitaly's talk. So uh, they have particular tools that they like, and you know, we have to, uh, you know, if they want to get buy-in from them, we have to do that. So where has differential privacy been used in practice to date? Sort of three instances that I can point to. Uh, one is uh, Google's Rapport, um, which is a way of tracking user statistics in, in the Chrome browser. Um, there's been a lot uh, written about that, and there's questions about how it's been implemented and whether it's been implemented correctly. Um, Apple made a big announcement saying, you know, one of their you know, flashy conferences saying, we're going to use differential privacy in our next version of iOS, and nobody knew what that meant. And we still don't know what it means because it's Apple and they don't tell us anything about what's going on internally. Somebody's done a recent forensic sort of analysis of, the, of what they're doing, and it also appears that they're not necessarily doing differential privacy properly, so, we, but, you know. Um, maybe things will improve. Um, the big, big buy-in has been from the United States Census, which for the, the decennial census, so every 10 years uh, they could count everybody in the country, and the Census Bureau of the U.S. has decided to use differential privacy quite extensively in publishing data as a result of the census. But the thing that these three applications have in common, which is sort of not machine learning, despite Vitaly's comment that basically machine learning is statistics, the, the kinds of statistics that they're computing here are uh, very simple, like counts and averages. Um, and that's because uh, you can get pretty good utility doing counts and averages. So um, uh, we've heard about sort of a, you know machine learning as a service, so there's kind of an idea that maybe differential privacy will allow something, private data as a service where instead of sharing data directly, we will share access to data. So in the context of research consortia, I have my, uh, my data sitting in my lab, and I'll let you have some kind of remote access to it. So this raises challenges in both engineering, you know, so how do we design these computing systems? What sort of uh, encryption do we want to do? Do we want to do secure multi-party computation? How can we do machine learning with multi-party computation? And then kind of application, social engineering, if you like, uh, issues where you have to retrain researchers to uh, use their data differently and to, you know, uh, re retrain the scientists uh, to, to be a bit more hygienic with the way that they're uh, treating their data. So this is, what that means is basically redoing the workflow um, as opposed to working in a model where, for example, you uh, take your original data and you publish a sanitized version of that data and then let people do whatever they want with it, um, which has proved to either be bad from a utility standpoint or bad from a privacy standpoint. We now have this model where there's a, a curator who kind of mediates the, the answers that come out of uh, the original data. And in this case, in a lot of cases, it's you know, adding noise in some way. And that's the, that noise, that randomness is what's going to guarantee privacy. <laughs> So specific use cases I worked on are sort of two in this setting. Uh, one is uh, when I was a postdoc in San Diego, uh, there's this clinical data warehouse which has about two million patient records. And they wanted to let people reuse uh, some of the uh, clinical data for, for research purposes. So they were trying to implement tools to allow people to do exploratory data analysis in a privacy-preserving way. And I think this is actually a very big, uh, Big application, I think, for, for differential privacy in, in, in this sort of uh, area. And the thing that I will talk about a little bit more is something called the point stack system, which we're working on right now, which is a system for doing uh, collaborative research in, in neuroinformatics. All right, so with that sort of motivation, we want to sort of talk about uh, how we model privacy. So <clears throat> remember, the setting, uh, one, one setting is, is 
is like this, where you have this data set of private uh, or privacy or sensitive data, and then you have some kind of, uh, a, a box which is a sanitizer, which can then release things. And the privacy barrier, if you like, uh, the difference between what's not public and public is sort of after the sanitizer. So and the sanitizer could be publishing all sorts of things about the data. It could be publishing a synthetic data set or some summary or a machine learning model. So uh, the uh, issue, uh, the, we, the things we'd like to, to guarantee uh, from the sanitizer is that uh, you know, we get useful answers, but we're also protecting, uh, protecting the data the data set. And particularly, we'd like to be robust to sort of side information that, uh, the, that an adversary might have uh, about the data set. So differential privacy does this by sort of positing, it's a hypothesis testing setup for those who do classical statistics, right? So we have two hypotheses. One in which Alice is in the data set, and one in which Bob is in the data set, and the adversary is interested in inferring whether Alice or Bob was in the data set. Um, and so you, you you imagine your two two parallel words, you shove it into your algorithm, which is going to guarantee some kind of privacy, and and say, suppose you observe a particular outcome, um, it, can you infer which of the two branches you were in, uh, the one of Alice or the one of Bob? And the uh, importance of this guarantee is that is this going back to this incentive idea that I mentioned, is that uh, each person can say consents to be a part of this process or not, and if you can guarantee that, oh, they're indistinguishable from some other person in the data set, maybe they'll have the incentive to, to agree to let you use their data. Um, so uh, I think this, is, this speaks a bit to uh, what Vitaly said, uh, you know, there are certain issues, uh, certain cases in which uh, Machine learning will violate your privacy, and uh, certain cases in which it will not violate your privacy. You, you talked about that a bit, so I, guess I don't need to, to go into that. But um, the, point, the way that differential privacy does this is in introducing randomness into the process of computation. So we, we, we randomize the algorithm that we're going to use, that we're going to use to compute the function that we want. And so when we run this randomized algorithm on uh, data with Alice in it or data with Bob in it, we should get similar distributions. And similarly, if we're not overfitting, we should also get similar distributions by training on very close data sets, right? So the randomness is introduced by the algorithm, and the privacy measure, or the, the way we measure privacy, is guaranteed by this randomness. It's a property of the random variable, random variables that we're using uh, there. So everything should be, you know, uh, we're interested in measuring things that are measurable with respect to that randomness. Um, and in particular, the mathematically, what it's saying for, in terms of this hypothesis testing problem, when you do hypothesis testing, you look at uh, likelihood ratio tests. It's saying that the likelihood ratio test is, is hard, or performs poorly, by saying that the likelihood ratio is bounded at, uh, uh, everywhere. So here's a you know, strong definition of differential privacy, the original one. That one was in the audience here, so he's probably seen this for a long time. Um, so we have uh, two databases, D and D prime. One has Alice in it, one has Bob in it. And Alice and Bob could be any, any uh, pair of ones here. Um, we, we, saw, we call the algorithm A diff epsilon differentially private if uh, we look at all possible outputs and we look at the, the log likelihood ratio between uh, the algorithm run on D and the algorithm run on D prime, and that likelihood ratio should be bounded. Um, or if you like, the, the, log, uh, the log likelihood ratio should be bounded. This is, a, this is a pretty strong guarantee, sort of point-wise. Um, it's uh, the opposite extreme from looking at something like the pullback Weigler divergence, or the relative entropy. And so some, some folks call this the max divergence uh, between the distribution of the output of the algorithm on input D and the distribution of the output of the algorithm on input D prime. So uh, if we want to relax the definition, uh, we, can, we can say, well, I don't want this to be bounded everywhere because maybe my space of outputs is very big and it, uh, things can kind of be ill-behaved Ill on, the, on the edges there. So I'll give myself a little slack and I'll say with the delta probability, I don't have to satisfy the guarantee. That's what this, uh, this definition would say. So, um, so you, essentially, it's, it's kind of like uh, uh, Tack learning type guarantee, you're saying, okay, probably one minus delta, I'm guaranteeing epsilon differential privacy. So that's, uh, that seems nice, but the problem is you don't know what's happening in this delta probability. I mean, for all you know, with probability delta, you're throwing away the entire data set, or you're publishing the entire data set, which would be very privacy violating. But that doesn't seem, that doesn't comport with your intuition, like anything sort of smart that you would do 
should have should uh, do, the performance should degrade gracefully as you as you go along. So we'll, we'll see this in a second. But first, I mean, what are the properties of differential privacy, and why why is it such an appealing definition or uh, model for using in the, in the particular application that I'm talking about? Um, one of the first property is this uh, post-processing invariance, which basically says once I compute something with the differential privacy and publish it, I don't need to worry about it any. You can do whatever you want with it, um, and uh, it's 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 fine with me. It's not going to increase the privacy risk. It's a uh, consequence. Uh, um, it's a type of data processing inequality if you uh, if you're an information theory person like me. Um, so in particular, you know the adversary might get an output uh, if you if you publish uh, some output with epsilon one delta one differential privacy, then kind of any non any non private post processing you do, including by legitimate users or an adversary, will not increase the privacy risk uh, by by any amount. So I guess going back here, you know. Uh, we want epsilon and delta to be small because the smaller they are, the closer the, these two probabilities are to each other. So small epsilon, you can leave epsilon as privacy risk. So the risk, epsilon and, and delta, this uh, failure probability, the, they don't increase if you, as long as you don't go back to the private data. And the other is uh, um, the other, the other uh, thing we need to, to care about is sort of, if I do multiple computations on the data, how much privacy am I losing? Right? How much risk am I taking on? And uh, it's a fact that uh, you know, there's no free lunch here. The more I publish about a data set, the more risk I'm going to be incurring in terms of privacy violations. And certainly, I can't be decreasing my risk. So we need a way to do privacy accounting that is, uh, if I do multiple rounds of computation on the data and publish multiple things about the data, we have to uh, figure out what's been lost uh, over time. And so that's this nice, uh, second nice property. Um, and here I'm stating kind of the, the I feel like the, the weakest form of this, this property, which is um, what we can call a graceful composition. That is, if I do multiple releases with different values of epsilon and delta, then at worst, I'm going to suffer the sum of the epsilons and the sum of the deltas. Okay, but again, we have this. Uh, uh, is coming up. I mean, so we can do better than this uh, if we kind of actually look at specific mechanisms. And so, but you know, the the uh, qualitative version of this result is that okay, we have a way of understanding the total risk as as we as we uh, go along in our uh, data processing life. So we start to take a closer look at uh, epsilon and delta. So one popular mechanism, for example, if I want to publish and privacy, a differentially private version of the mean, is to add Gaussian noise. Right? So Gaussian noise, uh, say a given variance, actually guarantees a whole range of epsilon delta guarantees. And that's because essentially what you're doing is showing, so here's, here are two Gaussians with different means because I've added Gaussian noise to two different uh, outputs of two different data sets which have two different means. Um, basically I'm saying, okay, in this range in the middle, the likelihood ratio is well controlled. And then outside that range, uh, you know, I say, uh, I say, I'll call all of the tail probability delta, right? But as you can see, it's not that it's not controlled. It's just that I'm kind of being lazy and cutting off the tails and saying, in that those tails are delta. Everything else is nice, and as long as my noise is not uh, an outlier, um, I have a complete flexibility though in where I choose to draw that line, where I, uh, where I'm going to choose the outliers. So for a particular distribution, I could be guaranteeing many different pairs of epsilon and delta kind of all simultaneously. So this is, a, this is important because it allows us to do sort of better accounting of the, of the privacy risk if we actually look at the, 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 the uh, randomness generated in the algorithm. And that's this idea about the moments accounting, which was mentioned uh, earlier this morning. So the idea is instead of, instead of saying, here's an algorithm, here are a bunch of algorithms, and I'll just tell you their epsilons and deltas, and then suffering the sum of the epsilons and sum of the deltas. Instead, what I'm going to do is actually uh, track uh, the, 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 this whole uh, trade-off curve uh, as, as I do multiple releases. So this, this, the reason you can do this is because if you, if you, if you, if you go back to the, 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 the picture with these Gaussians, Right, the actual number that you output gives you a particular value of that log likelihood ratio. And that's the actual risk that you suffer. And all the privacy definition is guaranteeing you is that that won't be any worse than epsilon. So 
if I actually look at that random variable that is the output and actually understand its distribution better, and pretty good about understand the moments of this distribution, um, I can do a much better job of controlling the privacy risk. Okay. So um, this is a so if I uh, so the spectrum of, of epsilon delta guarantees this is Gaussian noise. I think it was, I think it was some unit variance. Uh, you know we can trade off epsilon and delta while analyzing a particular mechanism. And if you look at this random variable, which is the log likelihood ratio. And treat it as a random variable, um, supremum over d and d prime. Then I can uh, I can uh, essentially keep track of this how this trade-off curve is evolving as I do multiple computations on the data. And this becomes very important when you're doing machine learning, where you're touching the data many times and pre-processing and validation and so on. So the, the way this, this typically the way this works is you essentially are, are sort of computing the moment generating function for each of your random variables, and then because uh, and then you add them, you're adding the privacy risk, uh, you're just essentially adding the, the moment generating functions. Um, and then basically, so if you're building a system, which is you know, what we're trying to do, building a system for doing differentially private uh, data processing, you uh, will keep track, uh, a log of, of these moments instead, and then when somebody says, how much privacy risk are you incurring, you'll go, and go back and then tell them a number, or tell them two numbers, epsilon and delta, afterwards. Um, which uh, 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 can, can save a lot. Uh, if you're interested in the theoretical framework for this, uh, this it's called Rainy Differential Privacy, and it's sort of, there's a nice paper which talks about the, the sort of probability theory behind this. All right, so how does all of this relate to sort of learning? Where do we introduce the noise in the more complicated than computing averages or computing counts? Um, so the two, uh, Two sort of canonical like, ways of uh, canonical ways of, of thinking about this is is that well it's easy to guarantee privacy if the thing you want to compute is not too sensitive to its inputs that is if you're not you know not really overfitting so changing one data point if switching out Alice with Bob doesn't make a big difference and this is a, this is the intuition behind uh, the global sensitivity method based in, in all sensitivity methods in the sense so you, what you do is you try to figure out how sensitive is the function you want to compute you know, the, the classifier that you'd like to train, how sensitive is that classifier to change one of the data points? If you think about support vector machines, uh, if you change a support vector, it, change, it can change quite a lot. So it could be quite sensitive. Um, but if it isn't, or you have a robust learning algorithm which is not sensitive to small perturbations in the input, say generated by uh, adversarial network, then you can do pretty well. Um, or if the function you're trying to compute is actually, you know, has many, what I say, pretty good approximations. Like, you know, the, the, there are many classifiers which would be pretty good. It doesn't matter which one you pick. Um, so uh, in that sense, there's a lot of good solutions. And then in which case, your, your solution is not very sensitive. Right? In that case, you can also uh, sort of randomly pick a solution, and it should be a good one if you're weighting, biasing your selection towards good solutions. So let's look at the global sensitivity method, because it's the easiest to describe. So the the problem is that, you know, given a function, f, you know, training a classifier, a sensitive data set, I want to find a differentially private approximation. You can think of this in, in the language of, of a, uh, approximation. I want to find a randomized approximation to f, which satisfies the definition. Uh, and so the simplest example here is, you know, uh, as I outlined before, can I find the average or the mean of the data points in uh, the data set? And so the canonical solution is compute the thing you want and add noise to it. And then, then it just once you decide that this is what you're going to do, uh, you just have to figure out what noise you want to make. Uh, so, uh, for those who have sort of seen differential privacy uh, and sort of you know audit talks or seen some papers or skimmed some abstracts, uh, Laplace noise figures quite prominently uh, in these analyses, and that's because the tails of the Laplace distribution uh, decay in a way that the log likelihood ratio is nicely controlled. So it's, Mathematically convenient, um, and it's it can be good for other reasons. So, so what we do is we try to figure out first the key quantity to, un to understand is the sensitivity of the function. So I have my function, which in this case we're thinking about the average, and I want to know uh, how much my function can change when I change one data point. I change my data set from d my, to a data set d prime, where I changed one of the data points. This could be, you know, this, this works for lots of different functions. This could be uh, 
the this could be the loss of my optimal classifier on uh, on these two data sets. And then what I'll do is I'll just compute the thing that I want, and I'll, I'll publish. I'll, I'll add noise to it. So this, if given this property of the function f and this uh, this distribution, you can just go through the uh, go through the calculation and show that this is guarantees your this stronger epsilon differential privacy. The other mechanism that that's uh, typically used is Gaussian noise. Everybody loves Gaussian noise. I'm a, I'm an electrical engineer by training, so we love Gaussian noise because it's the only thing you can understand really. Um, so again, you can you can compute the sensitivity and you can add Gaussian noise. And you know what you will read in some places is oh well this Gaussian noise will uh, guarantee uh, any epsilon delta combination. Uh, well, for for this. If you get, pick epsilon and delta and you choose the noise this way, you'll guarantee epsilon delta differential privacy. And I think a better way of thinking about it, going backwards and saying, I choose Gaussian noise of this variance, and it will guarantee all of these epsilon delta values simultaneously. Because that's going to buy you more when you're building systems. So if we apply this, uh, you know, go again for means to looking at the empirical risk minimization. You know, we want to minimize the loss on some training data of a classifier. Um, when we're going to put in some regularization to protect us against overfitting. Uh, so, you know, this seems like a good, you know, good situation. Uh, this, this should be easy to make uh, private. And so the question is, what do we want to do here, right? And uh, what we want to do is we would like to, with a a uh, moderately sized data set, we would like to get uh, both good privacy and good accuracy, but all these three things are kind of in, in fighting each other in some sense. Um, and in particular, one big uh, difference in thinking about um, private, uh, differentially private learning versus regular learning is that the privacy guarantee has to kind of hold, has to hold un, unconditionally. Uh, there's no assumption on the data distribution. Whereas the utility guarantees are allowed to assume, you know, for any distribution on the data, I will get to within the optimal uh, expected risk for that uh, model, uh, as long as n, the number of data points, is larger than something. So this x, we can balance the expected excess statistical risk. And in a sense, the, the difficulty, I uh, mean, to me, the difficulty in, in doing these kind of problems really stems from this, this fact that you're trying to get, you're trying to like, have your cake and eat it too, in a sense. You want it to be data independent. Uh, uh, on, on one side. So, uh, so you know the, the model here with the privacy barrier would be that you uh, you provide uh, the sanitizer uh, with your risk function that you wanted to use, like logistic loss or hinge loss, and then it'll it'll spit out a classifier. And so we want to get a good privacy accuracy uh, sample size trade off. So the question is why is uh, why is this not private already, because you know, if we're preventing overfitting, uh, then you should be okay. This is a much less sophisticated reason than Vitaly was talking about. Um, so it's very easy. If you change one of the, the training data points, you can, you'll can shift the classification boundary. In particular, for support vector machines, you'll, uh, you, you can, you, if you change one of the support vector machines, those support vectors, you'll, uh, you'll reveal uh, that change to, to an adversary. So and if you look at kernel learning, it's even worse because to compute the actual label for uh, uh, kernel-based learning, you actually have to take inner products with the data points than the training data itself. So somehow to compute the label, you are publishing part of the data set. <coughs> but uh, on the flip side, we know from, a, from the theory that privacy is, is compatible with learning in the sense that uh, stable learning algorithms uh, generalize, and I'm sorry, missing a reference on this, this third point, but Differential privacy can be uh, interpreted as a form of stability. So in the sense that, uh, you know, perturb the data set by a little bit, it, the output that shouldn't change a little bit, that's stability, that's also guaranteed privacy. And so these are two parts of the same story. So we have a sort of a, a tension here in terms of putting things into practice. Well, we know that privacy should imply generalization asymptotically, but for finite sample, we have this sort of trade-off between sample size and uh, privacy and accuracy. So, how do we make uh, ERM differentially private? And I guess I'm not going to give the uh, details in the interest of time, too, too many details, right? But so we have this uh, uh, 
nice problem that we, we solve all the time. So in, when we're doing learning, we kind of begin to give three steps in the learning process. First, we have to like, ingest the data. Then we have to you know, create the subjective function. Then we actually have to minimize the subjective function. So at each of these stages, we can say, well, maybe I'll try to make things private here. And then, then by post-processing invariance, all the other steps will remain, will get the same privacy guarantee. So these have uh, unsurprising names. If you, you could add noise to the data itself, this we would call input perturbation. Um, which can be a uh, good, as you've seen, is also in a good robustification technique. Um, you could also perturb the actual, the objective of this. So you know, after the argument, you could add a random term to that. That's, that's what we call objective perturbation. Why would that be a good idea? Because it might be that your uh, optimization surface is, um, you know, is not too sensitive to, to perturbations, whereas you know, maybe your data points uh, are fairly, you know, fairly sensitive. And the other thing you could do is, uh, you know, you could just instead I could say, I don't want to redo, uh, re-implement a gradient descent procedure or something like that. I just want to use black box somebody else's um, training algorithm. And then what you could do is if you could characterize the sensitivity of that training algorithm, you could just add noise to the resulting class of So you take your boundary and you go, yeah, and then you say, publish this thing instead. It's, it's randomized. So each of these uh, each of these options work, and if long as you choose the noise distribution properly and you analyze the sensitivity of the various quantities involved, either the argument itself or the, the objective function itself or the, the loss function itself, then you can figure out what noise to add to guarantee uh, the privacy that you want. Well, so it, typical empirical results are that um, it, are that uh, objective perturbation generally. Uh, performs output perturbation, but of course everything is data set dependent. Um, and moving away from this sort of epsilon, uh, stronger epsilon privacy guarantee to this approximate epsilon delta privacy guarantee, and so moving from, which is equivalent from moving to Laplace noise to Gaussian noise, buys you a lot. And I used to be kind of an epsilon, uh, delta equals zero kind of guy, and then now I'm, I've seen the light, and I realized that uh, you know, thanks to these better composition methods, that looking at epsilon delta met methods uh, really is kind of the way to go. But the thing I want to—we've done a lot of uh, a lot of empirical work, which I'm not sort of uh, putting up here. And the story is—I is, don't want to say it's like mixed from a—it's it's mixed in the sense that we don't have a good understanding at the moment uh, of how well a uh, differentially private method is going to perform on a particular data set. We don't even know what we can compute about the data set to say, oh yeah, privacy is easy for this data set, or privacy is hard for this data set. So we don't really, you know, the current approach is try a bunch of things and see, see how well it works, which is great for trying to figure out you know, what to do for the future, but it's not enough to build systems. So there's a lot of gaps, I think, between the theory and practice, which I think, yeah, hopefully some people in this room will, will be able to fix. Um, so the question, you know, the question you always get when I talk to to uh, pra practitioners who are concerned about privacy but don't um, haven't really thought about it is, well, okay, so why do I pick epsilon and delta? And then I say, oh, I don't know. Uh, you know, the best thing I could say is uh, is you know, ask the lawyers. Uh, also, don't know. Right? <laughs> don't ask the lawyers anything. Um, you know, given a data set, can I can I tell? Can I compute a, a sketch or something of the, what the privacy utility sample size trade-off is? Um, or before I start a study, I need to figure out how, many, how much data I need to collect. So what do I write into my grant proposal for, for data collection given that I want to use a certain level of privacy? These are all very important practical questions that you would need to answer if you're going to use, uh, that, that people want to have answers for. And we don't quite at the moment. We're still working on it. Um, the other thing is that uh, you know everybody has their own favorite algorithm that they run on their in their particular domain. So we have a lot of general techniques, uh, general uh, formulas or recipes for making algorithms differentially private, um, but they have to be tweaked a lot in practice to be to to tune to the domain specific uh, situations. Um, and then there's issues of scaling, uh, scaling to larger data sets. And there, the last point we have, uh, we, we do have some um, some answers. Um, so if you want to go, if you know, for if we're in, if we are in a big data regime, um, 
we, we, you know, things should be good because we have a lot of data, right? But the problem is we can't sort of do batch learning, so we have to do some um, everybody's favorite thing, stochastic gradient descent. So I would say that stochastic gradient descent is kind of popular. Um, it's, you know, and, and we might be kind of happy because, oh, it's stochastic gradient descent. Stochastic is random, random is private, you know, and we just do this sort of keyword uh, hopping around and we're like, okay, so we're already done, right? The stochastic gradients are already guaranteeing privacy. And it's not quite true, but um, it, you know, it, is, it, it gives one hope. But the problem is if you're doing SPD and you're, you're uh, say, uh, publishing intermediate results of your, of your training, uh, or you don't trust the person doing, trust the thing doing the, the computation, you're, you're leaking information as you go along. So we want to use SGD with a little extra randomization. So we're going to add noise for gradients um, to, to do this. And it, it works. It works uh, pretty well. And it can, you can do it in a couple of different ways. You know, we looked at that and got the noise to the gradient. Uh, you could also kind of randomize the direction of the gradient. So sometimes you take bad gradient steps, but not too often. Um, and so in both of these cases, uh, we're essentially doing approximate, uh, you know, stochastic, stochastic gradient descent, so doubly stochastic gradient descent. Um, and as long as we're, you know, careful about making sure that, uh, from the theory standpoint, that we're getting unbiased estimates, then we're, you know, we can churn through the analysis and you, you get convergence, you can copy the rate of convergence, all the things that you want. Um, and in particular, what you can do is, uh, is you can use it. Uh, so where is stochastic gradient descent most used now? Deep learning, right? So, um, right. So, so uh, we want to leverage uh, post-processing invariance and composition properties to do uh, deep learning. So, let me. Uh, sorry, modern machine learning apparently equals deep learning. So, you know, uh, it turns out that uh, so this is a really nice paper from two years ago, which uh, you know uh, uses this moments account idea that I mentioned earlier to to analyze using differentially private stochastic gradient descent to train a neural network. They do a lot of, and, and here's another example where they have to do a lot of extra extra work. They can't just like apply the technique of, like, I'll just add noise to the gradients and I'm done, right? They have to do a lot of gradient clipping and a bunch of other work to kind of, uh, you know, get it to, to really work. And that, 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 I don't want to call it hacking because the topic of this workshop is hacking, but, uh, you know, and it's not a hack. I mean, they have to just do a lot of uh, work to make uh, to make it actually work, right? And all of these uh, all of these extra things are not sort of things that we have good theory for necessarily in, in uh, differentially private learning. So how does this uh, how does this learning algorithm work? Uh, so you have this private data set. Uh, what it does is um, you uh, essentially select a random subset of the data, compute some gradients, post-process the gradients, and then once you post-process the gradients, you kind of keep track of, you have to keep track of the total privacy loss, you have this accountant system that's running in the background. And then you, you know, you, you uh, update your weight, your network weights. And uh, so it's using, as, as I said in the previous slide, it's using mini-batching, it's using some gradient clipping, it's using a, a couple of other things uh, in here. The, the, the cool thing is that it, that it, it does work uh, it does work pretty well, which was surprising because if you didn't do this, the, the thing is, if you didn't do this moments account, that is, if you didn't really do a good job of keeping track of the privacy uh, risk, you would end up saying like, oh, your epsilon is like 5,000 and your delta is like 0.5 or something like that. Right? So it would be very bad in a naive analysis. And so, uh, you know, empirically you can see uh, in, 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 in the, the result that the training and test error, you know, end up coming close to sort of the non-private deep learning methods. Obviously, you know, by the time this paper was published, there were like six other deep learning networks which did better than the one that they compared against. But, you, you, you know, you could also try and add noise to those gradients and see what happens. But, um, if you wanted to get only moderate loss, your epsilon and delta here are still not, they're, they're not huge necessarily, but they're, they're not negligible. Um, so, if you wanted to do this, in the you know in the wild, the privacy risk that you suffer is going to be uh, uh, maybe worse than uh, than uh, you'd want in a in a system. But we're you know this is a great improvement. We're going to make further improvements. So I'm, I'm I remain an optimist. Um, so 
this, I call this, uh, this a sort of proof of concept uh, in terms of uh, private learning. Um, and there's lots of interesting things that we don't quite know yet, and I'm sure that people will, will be coming up with in the, the future. And the second point, I think, is maybe more disturbing to the people in this workshop. How do these methods for generating adversarial examples, how can we, uh, or, you know, robustifying our classifiers, how do those, uh, can those also be used to guarantee privacy, or can we analyze those in the, in the language of privacy? So uh, the last few minutes, I want to kind of come back to the, the application that I'm looking at, so which is these research consortia, and they are surprisingly common. You know, as a my background is in, in communications, and uh, so in communications engineering, there's not so much. Uh, uh, it is not a kind of setup that that we have. So you have these situations where uh, researchers are say all a bunch of researchers are studying autism. And uh, they would like to be able to collaborate to do research. And uh, so that they do a lot of work to kind of set up these consortia, but then actually sharing the data becomes, uh, can become quite challenging. And so the current state of the art, if you like, in the, in the work in neuroimaging is this thing called the Enigma Project. It's an international project. It has a lot of working groups on different diseases. But basically, it is an algorithm by, uh, that operates through email and Excel spreadsheets. So, uh, you know, you propose a study to the people running the Enigma Consortium, and they say, okay, this is good. And then it, basically you send your code to everybody whose data you want to use. They run it, it generates a, a CSV file, you know, say with the regression parameters. And then you email those C, the CSV files to uh, the person running the study, who then averages the regression parameters, maybe in Excel. So, as computer scientists, probably this offends you, Sort of, sort of offends me, right? But this is like, you know, this is what they're, they're, they're stuck with. So uh, this, but you know, it, it's got huge buy-in. Like there's a lot of people who are, for this, this is like a game changer for them in terms of the questions they can answer. So if we can automate this and, uh, and introduce uh, privacy in the, in the communication process, then uh, we can, we can uh, expand these consortia even farther. So this is this point stack system uh, which is going to be built on top of this coin system, which has, uh, so here you can see, it has, okay, 38,000 uh, participants, um, maybe half a million data points. That's not big by, by, by certain application standards. Um, but it's a very wide collaboration. So we're hoping to kind of uh, introduce uh, difference in private learning algorithms for, uh, you know, and apply them to these systems and, and by saying we're, we're going to uh, provide these privacy preserving uh, ways of accessing uh, data owners data will uh, do better. So how does the system work? Uh, it's, it's the same, it's the same as the Excel thing except, you know, we don't use Excel. We, we have, uh, you know, we, we pass around JSON files and not through email. Uh, and uh, you know, we, we are, uh, we're still, we're in the, you know, you have a prototype right now, and uh, it seems to be working, uh, working okay, so, um, but the thing is, we have to build methods for things that people have not looked at in sort of difference in private learning before. Um, we have, obviously, algorithms for, for risk minimization and classification. Oh, this would be TISNI, not BISNI. Um, hmm? I said BISNI. Disney also makes sense. We did, you know, differentially private Disney, right? So the, 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 that's, uh, you know, so we want to have uh, uh, methods for, for, you know, basic unsupervised learning things, which maybe are kind of old, tiny for, for current machine learning. And then there's a lot of work in neuro, neuro imaging uh, on blind source separation because they really care a lot about separating out where signals are, you know, uh, you have a you have activity in the brain, and it's it's the result of a mixture of activity from from particular regions of the brain. So you'd like to be able to produce pictures like this, where you say, oh, the MRI that I observed is actually you know a linear combination of, of these activity regions. And then you go and talk to somebody who actually knows something about the brain. They say, oh yeah, that makes sense. Um, uh, but you know, deep learning is the, and the deep learning methods that are used here might be quite different than the deep learning methods that we're using, say for uh, CIFAR. Um, so I'm not going to really go into this figure so much as the, the, the takeaway, I think, from what we've been doing so far is, is that 
before in, in private learning, you were kind of hoping that you could, whatever you could learn without privacy, you can learn with privacy. And uh, I'd like to suggest that in applications like this, the what you can learn without privacy is what you can learn locally. And what you can learn with privacy is what you can learn jointly with privacy. And uh, that's, so that gap can be quite significant. So if you are in a situation like you are with a lot of uh, human health research where essentially centralizing your data is not allowed or not possible, uh, I think differential privacy provides uh, that incentive and protection that people are looking for to, to allow uh, you to use the, their data for your purpose. It gives incentive to share access. So, training and machine learning doesn't guarantee privacy, but there's a lot of different ways to incorporate differential privacy into prediction and learning, say using ERM, um, but also in, in these other algorithms that I mentioned, in, in graphical models, there's a lot of work on Bayesian statistics now. Um, good private algorithms should generalize, and the question is, do they on the data that you have? And uh, the uh, if you're going to, you know, this may be a little bit more technical, but if you're going to think about a privacy definition, you should really think about this uh, the approximate differential privacy, epsilon delta differential privacy. So even though you're making a slightly weaker guarantee, you can actually uh, uh, get much more useful algorithms. If you're interested in learning why this, this is very fast, um, there's some, from a few years ago, there was a, a nice uh, workshop at the Science Institute in Berkeley. There's a, a monograph uh, from the Foundations of Trend series, which has a, you know, a lot of details if you want to like, you know, do a class at a reading group. And if you want something shorter, or maybe a longer version of this, um, we did a tutorial in this just uh, last month. Um, so I think I'm going to close with this uh, since I'm out of time. And uh, thank you.